Right. Good morning. Oh, it's good afternoon. Sorry. It still feels like morning to me. Um, so welcome uh, to my session with uh, Kevin Moss of the World Resources Institute. Uh, my name is Rochelle Sampson. Um, many of you I know already, um, but for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting and for the purposes of this recording, I'm on the faculty here at the Robert H. Smith School of Business and the Logistics Business and Public Policy Group. I do a lot of work around ESG environment, helping companies to sort of make these transitions, see, uh, figure out what are the low hanging fruit for those organizations, and also identifying and understanding sort of the behavioral things that get in the way of making and creating change within organizations to solve some of our most pressing problems. So I noticed that we're all kind of very diffuse here, and uh, we have lots of room. Um, so I wonder, you know, even with social distancing, if you could just maybe move a little bit closer in, or if that's comfortable for you. Um, or not. That's okay too. Yes, exactly. People might not want to. That's right. So, well, let me pass it over to Kevin Moss. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a fireside chat. So Kevin's going to introduce um, himself to all of you, and then, uh, and then we'll just launch right in. Michelle, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I'm Kevin Moss. I'm with the World Resources Institute. We're an institute that works at the intersection of environment and human well-being. I like to say we're called the World Resources Institute rather than the World Environment Institute because we see the environment as a resource to support human development, but one that has to be used both equitably across today's generation and such in such a way, in a sustainable way, such that as a resource, it is still there for future generations. So that's who we are as an institute. Our heritage is as a think tank. We also think of ourselves very much as a do tank. What does that mean in practice? We produce a lot of publications as a think tank. As a do tank, we take a lot of our recommendations and we do them if somebody else isn't doing them or if we think we lend, they lend themselves to, to us. So for example, for people in the previous session, the GHG protocol, which is now a very important accounting protocol for carbon emissions, came out of a think tank piece of work WRI did 20 years ago, but nobody did it, so we did it. Um, and that's sort of the, the do tank part of the work. Um, I have a broadly corporate career. So I came up through mainly the telecommunications world in product management, marketing, corporate strategy, and made a shift into sustainability about 12, 13 years ago. I'm from the UK, but I've lived in the US for well over 20 years. And I moved across from the corporate world into WRI about six, seven years ago, seven years ago now. And I now also work sometimes with companies to help them do what they want to do, and sometimes adjacent to companies to push them to do more than they might otherwise want to do as a not-for-profit. I feel that's part of my mission is if, if it's in their comfort zone and they want to do it, there's probably a fantastic consultancy out there that will help them do it. Um, somebody has to do that job of, of pushing them further because none of us are doing enough yet. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kevin. It's a delight to be here with you today. Um, so our format is where this is a fireside chat, so it's intended to be kind of informal, a bit conversational, and um, we also would like to involve you as well. So um, I'll just start asking questions of Kevin at various points. We'll just open it up uh, for questions from the audience and then just kind of go back and forth in a very, like I said, conversational format. And if uh, along those lines, if there's something burning that's kind of coming up for you in terms of a question as we're speaking, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, lean in. Um, this is meant to be engaging of everyone in the room. So my first question for you, Kevin, because I know you've thought very deeply about these issues is, you know, what do you see as sort of the key challenges we face, but really at a systemic level, right? So not the super, we all know that, you know, there's these climate issues that are happening. We see all the symptoms and things like that, but what do you view as kind of the root cause, if you will? Um, I'm going to pick out two, two things. It's such a big question, Nick, you, and I can give you a hundred things and I can give you, I'm going to pick out two things that I think are particularly important. And then just say a few words about what is a systemic challenge? What does it mean to have a systemic challenge? Um, the two that I'd, I want to highlight are financial systems and consumption. And to some extent they're linked because there's a growth link across the two of them. But the more um, I work with companies, the more I see and experience that there are things they want to do and the things that they know how to do, 
that they simply can't do because of the way our financial model works at the moment. I don't think much of the climate challenge is a challenge of technology or a challenge of, of doing business. I think it's a challenge of how our companies currently make money. And there are two components to that that I see. One is growth and the other is short-termism. Um, there are many, many things companies can do that they know are the right thing to do if you think about the long-term impacts of climate. But if you're a first mover now as a company, there's a cost associated with them. So companies can't do them they, because it becomes a competitive disadvantage in the short term unless all of their peers do the same thing as well. So I think financial markets is one. The other is consumption, our what I sometimes call our addiction to consumption. I, I like to describe it, you know, when, when we're depressed, people talk about going a bit and getting a bit of retail therapy, shopping, buying stuff is going to make you happier. And when our economies are depressed, our government send us out to go shopping. I have a presentation with headlines from newspapers where governments send people out to go shopping. It's, it's in our culture to own, possess, buy stuff. Um, I think there are alternatives to that, but I think it's a, another systemic challenge that we face. I don't think it needs, needs to be human nature. Um, and if I can just say a word about systemic challenges. So I think of the, the, the world we're in as a system that is doing rational things the way the system is set up, the way government works, the way companies work, the way we react as citizens. We are doing individually, individually rational things, but the system is producing unsustainable outcomes. And therefore we need to change the system. If we do a little bit better at what we're doing wrong, all we'll do is really it's a little bit less bad. But what we actually have to do is work out how we change those systems entirely. And we'll get some opportunities to, to talk about what, that, what might that look like. But I, I was inspired by the theme of the conference um, of reimagining. Um, was it reimagining change? Reimagining change, was that the theme? Impact, reimagining impact. One of the things I'm increasingly asking employees of companies, the sustainability folks, particularly in companies to do, is reimagine what their role is and reimagine it from doing the best I can with what I've got to being the catalyst in the company for a more systemic change. And, and that's the, the, the theme of the conference and that reimagined work was what, what, what really appealed to me. So, so, so much food for thought there, you know, we could dive into short termism, which is a, a pet interest of mine. <laughs> yes. Um, but I'm, I'm so curious about, um, you know, getting beyond these kind of more superficial changes, right? So, you know, we recycle more, we, you know, make these kind of efforts, which it's not to say that they're not important too, but it, it, what you seem to be espousing is that we need to think very differently about how we're undertaking business, right? And so does this imply in your mind new business models? How do you think about overcoming this very systemic incentive issue around short-termism and capital markets and financial markets um, without making this another enormous question? But but how do you think about that, you know, taking it to where the rubber meets the road? You know, what does this actually look for, like for organizations and individuals within to be something more catalytic? Um, I, so I think of the, there being two different parts to, to respond to that. One is the types of companies and the way companies are set up now. Um, I actually, I wrote a blog post once on Father's Day called something like everything I learned about sustainability, I learned from my dad. Um, my father had a small business in a village in England, a place called Isha. He had a business that environmental people don't necessarily love. He was a farrier, made fur coats. But if we put the business aside at the moment, we can have a whole debate about whether or not that's a sustainable business. He had a local business. He had suppliers who he knew well. He was part of a smallish community of the fur trade. It was not in his interest for a supplier to go out of business. And it was not in his interest to do bad business with a customer. And it was not in, it was in his interest to look after his employees well, because he was in the local community. And the people that worked for him were the people he walked past in the street and met in the post office and at the pub and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, to me, that that's, lends itself to a sustainable model. 
Um, it doesn't guarantee it, but it lends itself to it. The problem I see we have at the moment is as businesses get bigger, you get more and more distance between the leadership of the business and the impact on the community. And then as businesses go public, you get an even bigger distance between the owners of the business and the managers of the business. And all of those distances are what lead us, I think, to, to models in, in many different components that are, that are um, systemically unsustainable. So one thing I've noticed, um, a couple of things I've noticed in the companies I work with, family owned businesses seem to be, even large ones, seem to be a, at a higher proportion of corporate, leadership, look, corporate leaders than completely publicly owned businesses. Mars, Lego, Walmart, and I'm not pretending any of them are perfect, but if I look at the leading businesses and the ones that are doing the more interesting things, family owned businesses, are um, overrepresented. There's a double-edged sword because you can be a family-owned business and have a value I don't believe in. Chick, um, is it, I think it was Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby might be two in that category. And you can take your business in another direction. But you as the owner and the manager, are you can't shirk responsibility for the value positions your business is taking. Um, the other is Nordics and Scandinavian business models, which often are owned by foundations rather than that you can buy shares, but the voting shares are with a foundation and a much smaller group of people who, who are accountable for, for what the company does. So one area is, is different ownership models of, of businesses. And Rochelle, I'll hand back to you. I've, I can also talk about business models at a more practical level, but you might have something to say on that yourself, I think. Right. So, yeah, so this is a lot of the research that I have done in the past has been around organizational form and capital markets and how that changes sort of incentives to invest for a longer term horizon, which would mean investments in things like workforce development, community engagement, um, you know, sustainable supply chains, you pollute less if it's in your backyard, um, you know, so all of the things that Kevin just highlighted. And we do know from larger scale studies, for example, that firms going private, like taken from public to private companies, are able to completely change the time horizons around their investments that they're making, right? So they're, they're able to make much longer term bets um, on R&D, on um, you know, supply chains, all of these things that I just mentioned. So, so we know that's a fact and that's true. And we've also seen other examples in addition to what Kevin's talking about, like there are these um, employee-owned co-ops, which is way beyond what you might be thinking of when I say the word co-op. We often think of the grocery store, the granola grocery store on the corner, right? Or Ace Hardware is a, is a co-op as well. These kind of member co-ops and things like that. So I'm actually talking about something much bigger than that, like the Mondragon in Northern Spain, which is about 85,000 employees and involved in heavy machinery and manufacturing, very capital intensive, very large organization, global, global impact, right? Um, they are a worker-owned cooperative. And so what that means is that when they experience economic downturns um, in their, their various lines of business, then they're much less likely to lay off their employees than, say, an equivalent public company, right? And what this has meant for them is greater resilience, generally higher productivity, because you don't have the same churn um, of employees kind of going through the organization through these boom-bust periods, Right? You have a lot more loyalty of individuals within the organization, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So there's a lot of benefits from that. You know, converting to something like that is not easy for firms. Right? So it's one thing to point out these examples. So you know, in some ways, it's really important to get these ideas in front of people who are starting businesses to really think very carefully about where you take money from. Right? How is your debt structured? How much debt are you taking on? Who are you going to be beholden to in the decisions that you are making? Right, so that becomes a crucial part of it, and that operates at all levels. Um, and yeah, please. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut off. No, no, that's okay. Go ahead. But I just wanted to ask Kevin, where do you see benefit corporations if people are fitting into this idea that you're saying that you need to structure the organization that's too far away from the people to do this? Mm -hmm. um, I haven't looked closely at B corporations, but the, the general idea of being able to say I don't exist just to deliver the most profit, I, I, 
I certainly warm to and like that. So, you know, I, I think businesses need to be able to say, I have a mission other than to deliver the most profit if that's what they want to do. Um, I have understood from conversations I've been involved in that there is a misunderstanding in American businesses that that's what you have to do and that you can be sued if you don't. And that actually business has a lot more flexibility than it likes to think it does here or than it, than it thinks it does. But I haven't researched that myself, but I've been corrected on it a, a few times. But yeah, the general idea I like, I'm not close enough to the detail of what it takes to be a B Corporation to, to comment on that one specifically. Yeah, so B that's right. So you're not an LLC, you're an ink, you're a B board. And so it's a legal standard that has these five areas of impact that the state must consider in all of the business practices. So I just wonder if is that a solution to the, the issue that you're discussing. If you th it, it depends on, I guess, where you think the pressures are coming from, right? Um, if you think it's coming from proxy fights, from shareholders and things like that, that are saying you're making bad decisions, um, that are, you know, prioritizing, say, some of these other aspects of mission that aren't immediately profit driven, then yes, right? It should help because it should protect you from that. You are allowed legally to make uh, part of your mission and MO as an organization something other than maximization of profits. Now, how that operates in practice is entirely different, right? Because you can have proxy wars over all kinds of things that aren't immediately about money, but do have the impact of shutting down some of these broader objectives of the organization. But it's intended to be a step in the right direction. There hasn't been a lot of testing of it yet, but to Kevin's point, legally, if you really dig into it, um, I'm going to have to remember that there's the shareholder myth book. Um, that's a, yeah, have you, are you familiar with this one? Yeah, yeah, by a legal scholar, Lynn, the late Lynn Stout, who's written, it's a thin book, I highly recommend it. And it takes apart the whole myth of needing to actually maximize profits from a legal standpoint that you actually, that's actually a myth. Um, so that's there. So, but, but while we have this pause, let me open it up to other questions or comments or thoughts from the audience, anyone else? Please. Uh, so you mentioned you know, the systemic issue, what role do you think that public policy can play um, in fixing some of these issues? Because I know, you know changing the, the structure of our capital markets or changing uh, the structure of the majority of our business has been very difficult, but doing something like having to disclose uh, externalities so that they're felt immediately um, is that something that, that can help with these types of problems? Um, yeah, I mean, I think public policy is absolutely critical. Um, we've tended, I think we're in an environment at the moment where we're, we're depending a lot on voluntary um, actions by companies. Um, I had a piece published in The Hill a couple of weeks ago which where, in which I said government needs to retake the lead. We, we, we can't afford to be in a place where our future depends on voluntary actions by companies because those will stop as soon as they're not competitively um, beneficial for the company to do. Um, the, my experience is that the US finds that much harder than Europe, for example, to, to actually embrace the idea of legislation and regulation as a way of evening the playing field. So we all know we need to take action, we all know there, there can be a first mover disadvantage. We like to say there's a first mover advantage, but I think often there is actually a cost for the first mover. Um, the solution to that is let's just make us all do it and even the playing field. And then we're not at a competitive disadvantage. Our whole sector, our, our whole industry has to do it. So, you know, the, the SEC um, proposals that are out at the moment are our a highlight for me of something that will help achieve that. Everybody has to do it. So the companies that put resources into carbon accounting are not, are not at a disadvantage because there's a whole bunch of others in their sector that are not doing it. And just to tally off that, what role do you think global standards centers can play um, in helping guide that? Because a lot of times, at least what I hear is, you know, we're not able to, to come up with these different schemes until, or to do these actions until there are standards in place. Um, do, you, do you see the role of global standard setters? Kind of and so what, what role do what standard setters? Global, global standard setters. So, oh, standards. so financial stability board. Um, oh, I ISP, think, yeah, yeah. Just as examples. I think all those things are, are vitally important, but I, I reject 
any company that says we can't do it because there isn't a standard unless that company can demonstrate that it has tried and supported getting the standard in place. And I would argue that in many cases, you can find that company has, re has resisted getting a standard in place. So I, I think standards are, are critical. All of this stuff has to happen in parallel. You need standards when you've got policy, but to get policy, you need a standard. It, this needs us, the industry across the piece to agree to progress. And I'd urge all of you, I, I'm guessing most of you are, are students um, or, or faculty here, but when, no? Oh, it's very mixed. I, if you're in a company, if you're thinking of applying to a company, look carefully at what they're going to say about the SEC proposals and whether they're embracing and other equivalent things. Are they embracing it and being part of moving the industry forward or are they resisting it? Because it's it's much easier to resist than embrace. But if they're resisting it, we're not, we're not going to get any we're not going to get anywhere. We need we need a collective embracing of these, and we'll fix the problems that go along. It's not it's not immediately straightforward, but we've got to fix these problems in the next two three years if we're going to get where we need to by twenty thirty. Mm -hmm. very interdisciplinary and I'm curious have there been any backgrounds or any people you've come across that have really changed the way you look at our sustainability issues or the issue of avoiding making money and people from different parts of, of business or part of other uh, disciplines I guess people you mean individual yeah. named no not necessarily named people but but I've, I've just noticed that sometimes People who see sustainability as a data problem look at look at the issues differently than people who see uh, maybe parts of diversity and equity in sustainability and sort of looking at an inter intersectional lens of the issues that we're facing. And, and curious, just just. Um. I'm not sure I know how to pick an answer of because I it it is an interdisciplinary issue. In fact, my my background prior to coming into sustainability that I think served me very well with, was product management, where I had to understand a little bit of what the engineers were saying and a little bit of what the accountants were saying and a little bit of what the billing folks were saying and a little bit of what the marketing folks and the lawyers were saying, but, but and often, and, and bring all of those things together to deliver a product to the market because it needed all those things to work. Um, and I think that served me well in, in sustainability. So I don't know how to pick out for you uh, yeah. A, a, a particular area. I mean, there is sometimes I do find in practice there is sometimes a value in us separating out the issues, um, but we can't become so siloed that we don't also understand the intersections. And I think a lot of the the, the place we are at at the moment and have been at, coming to over the last year or two in my organisation and in companies is getting that balance right and making sure we are. We understand the issues in their silos, but we also understand the intersections um, the, or the, and the interactions between them. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, I, I, there are many things I could say, but I would just say that it is truly, as you know, intersectional, right? So um, that you cannot disentangle social justice from environmental issues, right? You try to solve environmental issues, you create all sorts of social justice and equity issues. You try to solve those issues, you create environmental issues and vice versa. And so it's just, it's going to be messy, it's going to be complicated, it doesn't mean we don't try to solve it. Um, but, but those things are hand in glove, whether anyone will say it or not. Um, but, but you cannot um, just sort of disentangle them. I mean, and it's even just even very basic thinking of, you know, this country was built on fossil fuels, you know, and then in other parts of the world that where economies are less developed, who are we to say that they can't use fossil fuels to develop their economies, right? Uh, you know, even though we're facing this climate crisis. And so, you know, so there's all of these kinds of equity issues. There's intergenerational, there's within generational, there, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, um, but it's it obviously messy and complicated, but you can never disentangle those issues. I know there was another question though too. Um, Kevin, I have a question because I want to challenge you if I may. First, you come out of the mess of telecommunications space for a long time in that sky, and uh, you kind of travel your own journey 
And today you're sitting in a spot where you easily see the playing field. And it's easy to say when you sit on the playing field, you're a Liverpool guy and like Klopp does and has all these great players. And you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do that. My question to you is on your own journey, um, having gone through it, people who are in this room here who are starting the journey, what would you tell them? What would be kind of step one, step two, step three in terms of perspective, but also practical advice in potentially reorganizing, restructuring, and reculturating the organization that, in your opinion, or where you sit as a It was a long question. <laughs> Don't you want to have the first go? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I could go too, but you want a minute? Um, yeah, I'll take a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I'm sorry, I, I, uh, I love that question. And what do you do? I uh, work with people. I'm very curious about the human mind and how people interact right. in the environments that they move in. So that's why I'm curious. Were you the starting? I was the starting guy. Were you the, the keynote at the beginning yeah. that I? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know me. You know me. All right, we'll come yeah. out. That was not the intent, by the way. No, 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 no. I'm really curious about it because I'm like everybody else. I'm learning about the issue. Right. Uh, it's for me something, frankly, I mean, almost to the point where I registered for the conference to come was like ESG. What the heck is that? Right. Right. Uh, I'd be very honest, CSR was very familiar with the integration of it now. Yep. I think it's much more relevant, uh, particularly under the side of G. Oh, you know? okay. So All that's right. the piece I'm very curious about. I've got some thoughts now. But... <laughs> Ali did ask you. I'll weigh in after you. All right. I, I don't love the ESG acronym because I think it brings. Um, it, 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 it brings a lot of the issues down. It, it oversimplifies the issues that we're, we're facing. Um, I think some of the things we're facing can be counted. Carbon can be counted. I mean, there's a, you know, I'm sure you've all heard, you know, what you can't measure, you, you can't manage, right? There's another phrase, I've, I don't know if you've heard this, but not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. And a lot of the stuff in the sustainability space is in, in my mind, in that category. Um, the social stuff is much harder to count. It's much less, um, sub, it's much more subjective and less objective to be able to say, well, what's the right level of equity? What, what's the acceptable gap between the rich and the poor? Um, in the biodiversity world, it's much harder to count. I mean, how much species um, annihilation is okay? One species or none, no species or a million, you know, what's, so some of the, the, the ESG um, I think can be great for some of the things that are measurable. I do worry, so I've gone off the topic a little bit of what you asked me, but I do worry a little that it, it can take us down the path of a checkbox exercise um, where somebody can say, well, I've done all the things in the list, so, so ev everything is okay. Um, the, uh, let me try and go back to the, the what was it? tell me the question again. The, the, <laughs> what's a good starting point? Right, right. Right. But also, you know, go do with companies. How do you apply it? I mean, what's kind of the, the baby steps everybody can hear? If it's a startup, if it's a very mature startup, if it's somebody who's looking to work right. with somebody, because uh, I mentioned in my, you know, that 86% of the workforce is generation X and B. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we're dealing with. So if everybody who sits here is graduates or comebackers and showing off the graduation, they go, hmm, that's not the company I want to work for because they're destroying the planet. Oh, what does that mean? Right, so right. That's a bit of right. Um, I think it can be very hard at the moment to find a company that is uh, that is perfect, that is well set up, and that is going to meet everything you want. Um, you know, maybe going and joining the solar a, a company that's building solar panels, for example, might be a company that's hard to fault. Even then, you can come up with issues that that they that, that they've got. But maybe you know a solar company or somebody who's business is purely um, renewable energy or recycling or, or something like that. But the... Let me jump in, but I, what I really want to get at, and, and now that you're talking, I want to kind of push a little personal, personal. How has your perspective changed? That's, I think, what I'm really interested in. My... Your evolution of, uh, yeah. I'll work for MCI. Okay. Yeah. I mean, at that point, you didn't have the conversation. Now you're having, you're one of the leaders of the conversation now, not just here, but in general, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. nature of what the organization does. How has that shifted? And what do we self reflective look at that makes us somebody in another side? I think you said it, I said it this morning. Um, we're all catalysts, right? we're all part of a community. We need to drive 
with our own accountability and the responsibility of people. How has your shift been? That's what I'm curious about. My, my, sh my shift. I'm sorry, I don't mean to. No, no. I have shifted from thinking we can get where we need to get by doing what we do a bit better to not believing we can that will get us where we need to get and we have to get uncomfortable um and we have to be a little awkward that you know being a be, we have to take positions that will make the people around us feel uncomfortable um in fact i i i often now when i'm talking to companies say if I don't make you feel uncomfortable, I'm probably not doing my job because the level of transformation we need, you know, we've, we've, we can sit and give, most of the companies I work with can give lists and lists of all the great things they're doing, but the trajectory is still moving in the wrong direction, the global trajectory and probably even their individual company's trajectory. Therefore, if what we are doing is not making the, our, us ourselves and because we have to have empathy for the people we're talking to, us ourselves and the people we're talking to feel un uh, uncomfortable, then we're probably not asking for enough. Now, you don't want to make them feel so uncomfortable that they don't want to bother to come into work the next day or that they get fired, because if they're the people who want to make the change, they've got to be inspired and want to, want to, 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 to stay in the job and want to make that change. But we... Um, at the same time, you can't be so comfortable in the job that we think what we're doing is good enough because we we know collectively what we're not what we're doing is not good enough. Mm -hmm. Did that get a, a little closer? Yeah. Can I add a lot to that one yeah. too? Sorry. So um, so just on that, that's such a good question, and and I so appreciate that you. Well, all the questions are fantastic, but I, I do appreciate you asking that because I do feel like all the changes come from within. Um, and, you know, for myself, it came from just a curiosity and an interest in the environment. Um, I had students who asked me, they could see that I was interested and they said, would you please teach a course on this? And so that's when I first developed that course, you know, 15 some years ago. And, um, you know, and then my research moved in that direction. And, you know, the first stage is, it's like the stages of grief, you know, it's denial, it's, you know, rage, it's all these things. And you can plummet pretty far once you realize the gravity of the issues that we face. Um, and then you start pulling through to the other side of, okay, well, what can we do in this moment, right? And um, so then I personally shifted to a very information-based strategy. So I'm a researcher that's in my toolkit. Let me, you know, show companies like this is the low hanging fruit this is how we create change this is what's most meaningful for your organization that type of thing and you know that has some modest effectiveness but then what i realized is there's all sorts of behavioral things in the way right this is about changing hearts and minds and with human behavior and that's where it really gets interesting um and so you know, to your point about a co uncomfortable conversations, it's like your success in just about any domain is how willing are you to have uncomfortable conversations and sit in those places and be in community with others who are also willing to be in those uncomfortable places, right? And still hold the space and respect for each other while we have these conversations. And so in some ways it, it starts very granular it's about building teams, building trust, building community, building the ability to have tough conversations, learning the language around it, having empathy for those who have different opinions from ourselves. Because even those who are very different, we might consider to have very different opinions. In some ways, we all want the same thing. We want to a good life. We want time with our family and friends, doing things we enjoy and find meaningful in life, right? And so, to that end, there's always room for finding something common, but there's a lot to this behavioral stuff and learning to communicate um, and then mode, being motivated from that internal drive. But measurement's important too, right? So we can't know how these other companies are doing and consumers cannot react to what firms are doing without comparable information between the firms. While they're self-reporting and it's all voluntary, it's not audited, we have no idea if one company is doing better than another. And it's a starting point. That's all it is. Right. So anyway, end of monologue. So thank you. I for just kind of want to make this comment. I'm kind of to the people in the room that, I mean, your journeys are great, but there's like a whole other story. I worked for Exxon Mobil and I ended up at Exxon Mobil after my fiance died. I was diagnosed with cancer. I needed health insurance. 
do I, am I proud of my time there? Not really. But I have two friends who are still there. And one of them's husband had a stroke and she had two kids under the age of five. She can't leave. So I think to assume that everybody in these companies are bad people. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and Absolutely. Well, I agree. You get that from the sustainability community. Absolutely. And that a lot of really good people want to make changes, but they don't have any power. And that goes back to the financial discussion of how do we get these people who have good intentions, but literally have no power in society to make those changes. Because the journey sometimes is not by choice. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't think you were asking a bad question, but I just wanted to say, like, Absolutely. I got that when I went to ExxonMobil, somebody said, somebody was really hostile to me. They're like, you were the most evil person around. And I was like, well, that or homeless. Like, <laughs> you know, like, what are my options? So I just, like, I feel like sometimes these journeys are not what we think they're going to be. And we don't know where I'm going to end up in a few years. But, you know, now I own my own company. So that's oh, okay. nice. so that works out. <laughs> so first of all, I'm sorry what you're going through. Oh, no, 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 I'm fine. This no, but I mean. Yeah. It's a dream. Yeah, yeah I know. Like, I am so much smarter say, for having The intent done. was not to say the people who worked are not bad people. The intent was really, if you think about like technology demand and supply, right? Market demand and market supply. I think what's happening is we're kind of in this old day. You're going to take Motorola. Right? Motorola said, we got this cool product. We're going to push it to the market. The consumer said, no way in hell we don't want it. I believe that employees, if given the choice, They'll make that same choice of choosing not to be there if they have the choice to not be there. That's my point. If that was a misunderstanding, my apologies. That certainly was not. Oh no, 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 no. I just I just want to make sure, like that I just want to give a real example of like I didn't have a choice. Absolutely. And when I have a choice, I migrated out. But I know a lot of people don't have that choice. And I feel like that goes back to the question that was asked in your session mm -hmm. about how do we help people who don't have the same options Absolutely. so they have the same choices? Because then I think the market forces would be real. Right now, the market forces aren't real because they're stuck. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, COVID hasn't helped us with some of the hardships uh, exactly. that people went through. So I completely get and, I, and I think that goes back to the financial power of like, and I mean, going back to the whole, you know, SEC restrictions that I've watched ExxonMobil weaponize some of those metrics against very tiny companies to drive them out of business. And I feel like, I believe a couple of these companies, the smaller ones, were like, we just don't have a bandwidth to do this. We, don't, we can't develop a metric. We're just trying to stay alive against this company that is pouring legal resources against us every day. And so I think that like looking at smaller companies trying to grow differently than a behemoth that's been around for 100 years is also important as we look at the ESG growing. But, you know, so much, so much food for thought here. First of all, I'm going to pass this to Kevin, and I, I know there are some other questions here too. Please. Oh, um, well, I just wanted to get back to your point about changing behaviors and hearts and minds, and to really ask both of you. So, you know, the people who will be making these decisions ultimately are at the top, but is it the role of the sustainability leaders of these corporations now to try and learn and establish that trust with the people at the top to get them to make those changes? Like, where do you see? the inspiration, the action happening in these corporations? My answer would be it's, 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 it's the role of both. I don't think this, the, chief, the chief executive officer or the board can sit there and wait to be persuaded. Um, and I don't think the chief sustainability officer can, or the sustainability team can sit back and wait to be, to be asked. Um, so I think both, both of those need, need to happen. Um, I do see two different types of sustainability practitioners in companies. I see people who have primarily come from public relations and who see it's their best job, their job to spin the best story they can with the material they've got. And I see other people who are coming into the job who are passionate about environmental change and the change that needs to happen, who are more willing to be the catalysts and, and push for change. I see those two different types. Now, the, the field is expanding a lot now and there's now engineers coming into the field and accountants and, and all sorts as well. But historically, I've seen those two different types. I have always been more fulfilled working with people who have come with more of a passion background for, for the environmental change. Um, 
I do, I do want to put, can, can I put a couple of positive, I feel like we've, we've yes, we, I, I want to put out a couple of ideas for some really exciting things that, are, that I see out there at the moment. Um, I, I also, I believe there are a couple of different approaches to sustainability um, change. One is what I think of sustainability by stealth, when you do something without calling it sustainability. And the, the other is sustainability, you know, when you're with, with great in, well, it's more, where you market it as, as sustainability and you're very purposeful about the change you're trying to make. And I think they're both valid um, approaches. Um, but are, are people familiar with SodaStream? People know what a SodaStream machine is, right? Do people know much about the company SodaStream? Are they? So SodaStream, and the thing that excites me about SodaStream is that it's a replacement for the bottling bit, the soda bottling business. Let's put aside where we, whether we think soda and sugar and stuff is good or not, right? But SodaStream is a replacement for the bottling business, right? You still have a fizzy drink at home, but a, oh, that's a Britishism, probably a fizzy drink, isn't it? You still have a soda at home, but you didn't go to the store and buy 24 bottles of soda, which had to be shipped halfway around the country and then shipped home in 24 plastic bottles. And Pepsi and Coke do a great job of talking about how they lightweight their bottles and how their bottles are recyclable, but there's still 24 bottles or cans taking up an enormous amount of space. SodaStream challenges, in my mind, the entire bottling business, and it's owned by Pepsi. So to me, SodaStream is sustainability by stealth, right? It is, and it is quite exciting to me that Pepsi has actually chosen to invest in something. I mean, Pepsi is not really a drinks business. It's really a bottling business. And that Pepsi has chosen to invest in something which potentially undermines their bottling business, that whole set of shelves. I mean, there's a whole set of shelves at my supermarket that's just dedicated to soda, probably the least nutritional thing in the supermarket, but it's 1% you know, of our nutritional value and 20% of the space in the supermarket shelf. And in the, that means in the truck that delivers it to you. And Pepsi have invested in something that undermines it. To me, that is a bright spot. And that is the sort of thing I love to see that gets me excited. I don't know where the Pepsi are sitting there. I mean, I've asked them, but I don't know where the Pepsi are sitting there thinking, this is our sustainability play. I like to think that some of them are sitting there doing that. Um, I just want to give you one other example. I've spent a lot of, I have this, this 2030 vision I like to roll out. Today, I walk into Walmart and I can spend most, about 100% of my money on buying new stuff. The vision I have for 2030 is I'll be able to walk into Walmart and spend a third of my money on buying new stuff, a third of my money on buying something that somebody else has previously owned. I may or may not know that. I may or may not care about that. It may or may not be on the same shelf. It sort of doesn't matter to me. And a third of my money on fixing something that's broken or upgrading it or redesigning it. So I walk, I have used two thirds less resources. I've spent the same amount of money. So Walmart's still making money, which means they can pay their, pay their shareholders, which means they can raise wealth, which means they can employ people. Ideally, it's created more jobs because the person that fixed my shoes instead of making a new pair of shoes on a production line is probably more labor and probably more interesting labor. Um, but we've, so we've kept the economy going and we've cut out pretty much two thirds of the resources needed, which is the sort of order of magnitude of change we need to bring people out of poverty around the world. And for the third they're still doing, they've still got to do recycling, they've still got to do efficiency, they still got to do waste reductions, still got to put solar panels on the roof, right? That's the vision, right? I was laughed out, I wasn't exactly laughed out of the room, but conversations like that with large retail companies five years ago were not acceptable. I had people ask me not to run a panel at a conference on that. We produced a paper called The Elephant in the Boardroom about unchecked consumption. And within two years, and we weren't the only ones, other people were having, I could run a conference panel at a big conference instead of in front of 400 people talking about consumption. And Walmart now has a partnership with a company called ThreadUp, which is about selling re, re, um, um, re, re, pre-worn clothes as does Nordstrom. So it's not just Walmart, it's the Nordstrom end of the market as well. So the, now it's not a third of their business yet. It's probably a tiny, tiny bit. 
But five years ago, I had sustainability people in similar companies tell me this was not a topic they could talk about in their company and keep their job. And here we are now, and they've got public partnerships, and they're doing press releases, and they're working. We have by no means solved the problem, but I do think that the people that introduce these conversations in these companies, in the sustainability jobs, young people coming in in marketing jobs and product management jobs are the ones that are going to make this, this sort of change. So I am hopeful and optimistic. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, and I will say that progress tends to be nonlinear in this space as well. It can accelerate very quickly, right? It's not just this uh, sort of plotting progress. And, uh, you know, to these examples, there's another few favorites that I have. One is Interface Floor, which you've probably heard of, that make those carpet tiles. So they had it, Ray Anderson, who headed up the company at the time, had realized so much carpet was going to landfill um, and completely redesigned it so that everything in it was upcyclable and they would take all the carpet back. And they was doing it for sustainability reasons, even though he didn't call it that. But what he found was they saved so much money, it saved the business in an economic downturn. Uh, because of how they had reorganized their operating practices. So there were many benefits of, in fact, doing things or doing business that way. Um, Subaru manufactures cars in Indiana for all of North America. They are a zero waste facility. They send zero to the landfill, nothing. This heavy manufacturing, this means solvents, paints, everything. Um, and they did this with sort of initiative from the organization, but primarily it came from employees. So now they have a very engaged workforce. They send nothing to landfill. They've saved enormous amounts on costs because they redesigned some practices to reduce, say, copper slag from welding practices, et cetera. So there's a lot of unanticipated benefits that often come from these kinds of practices that are actually just better ways of doing business. And it just requires kind of the space and breadth for thinking about it. But I noticed that we are at time, um, and uh, that was a very fast fireside chat. And we might call it a, a fireside bonfire because you, you all were involved too. So we were all sitting around the fire as opposed to us in the fireplace. But um, I thank you all for being here today, um, for your engagement in this work. Look forward to continued conversations. And I particularly want to thank Kevin Moss um, from the World Resources Institute for taking his time and bringing his expertise um, and thoughtfulness to bear and sharing it with all of us here. Thank you so much for your work, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you.